Now in all of physics, we've only been able to identify four fundamental forces. This seems to be all that nature has provided us. In an order of strength, we have the unimaginatively named strong nuclear force, electromagnetism, the weak nuclear force, and gravitation. So this is by far the strongest, and then we have the by far the weakest in gravity. Everything that we've been considering so far of interatomic forces has been strictly related to electromagnetism. It's the only thing relevant at this particular distance scale. And when you're considering electromagnetism, there's really two different theories that you can work with. What we've been working with in our last video was all classical electrostatic theory. And really the basis of all the potentials is Coulomb's law. But we saw that we also need to consider, particularly for van der Waals, some quantum mechanics. And the quantum mechanics gives us information about the electron distributions in more complicated systems in which there aren't full charges to plug into the standard form of Coulomb's law. But I wanted to consider a theorem that really ties all this together. Now the theorem is known as the Hellman-Feynman theorem. Feynman wrote about it in 1939 in a lovely paper called Forces in Molecules, which you can look up. But the basic premise that this theorem states is that once you've solved the Schrodinger equation, which gives us these eigenstates. Now these give us the spatial distributions of the electrons, or the electron clouds, if you will. All the forces in the system can be calculated using classical electrostatic theory and simply applying the Coulomb's force and such. So first you take a system with nuclei with however many electrons there are, you plug it into the Schrodinger equation, you solve for the size, the eigenstates, and then you can just use classical theory to find all the forces within the molecule, between the atoms, and between the nuclei. So to explain this theorem a bit more, let's say we have some parameter lambda. Now lambda could be equal to, for example, x, or y, or z, or any positional coordinate of the system. We're just giving it this general name. And how, in general, we would find the force in the lambda direction would be to take the negative derivative of the potential energy, or just of the energy of the system, with respect to that coordinate. So if we wanted to find the force in the x direction, take the negative derivative of the energy with respect to x. And what Feynman showed in his paper is that you can actually compute this as just the average or the expectation value put the negative sign just carrying through, of the derivative of the Hamiltonian. So what is this in, in, well, in classical theory, in quantum theory rather? This would be just sandwiching it between state psi, the derivative with respect to lambda, and the state psi. So that's how we write the matrix elements. So 
So I know we're not quite yet familiar with this notation, but if we wanted to write it in terms of more integral notation, what this simply means is take the wave function, complex conjugated, sandwich it in the derivative of the Hamiltonian, and put the regular wave function, and then integrate over volume. So this would then give you the force in the lambda direction. And what is h but the operator that combines kinetic and potential energy, which we'll write u in this case. We could also write it as v sometimes, but this is kinetic t and potential energy u. Now, if we're considering the standard Hamiltonian of an atomic system, usually the kinetic energy, we can write it as a function of the momenta, such as p hat squared over 2m. That's usually how we write down the kinetic energy. But the potential, in general, is a function of the coordinates. We could say it's the function of the position x or position r, something like that. So if we take the derivative of the total Hamiltonian with respect to a position coordinate lambda, typically that's just going to be equal to the derivative of the potential with respect to a lambda. So we have a little bit of a simplification there. So we can actually write that the force for a typical atomic system actually just ends up being this, negative sine, psi star, psi, derivative of the potential, and then integrate it over volume. So that's a pretty straightforward way to perform these calculations. Once you find these forces, you'll see how they reduced down to just the classical equations of force. You get electron charge densities that are distributed, which can be ex explained everything from van der Waals to charge-charge interactions. Now you might be saying, great, we're done. But the problem is, what this assumes is that we can solve the Schrodinger equation. It's assuming we have these already. And the basic time-independent Schrodinger equation is just this where you can find the energy of the system given a Hamiltonian, and you can find these eigenstates psi. The problem is this is very, very hard to do in general. The simplest molecule you can think of would be H2, diatomic hydrogen. That is even difficult to solve, and you have to resort to pretty complex perturbation theory to solve it. And so while this in principle can be done for any force, any molecule with any number of atoms and nuclei, the actual quantum mechanical portion of this computation can be very difficult. And it's only been with the advent of supercomputers and very powerful computation techniques that we've actually been able to solve these systems, not analytically, but numerically. Thank you.